you're back here with us on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting from Think Tech Studios in Pioneer Plaza. Glad to be back here. Uh, Ethan Allen, your host. And uh, we're going to be talking today with a, uh, about something that we can't even see, viruses. And we're going to be talking with Dexter Poon. Hi. Welcome, Dexter. Hi, Ethan. It's glad to have you on the show. And uh, so tell, tell me this, Dexter. How, you know, viruses are, are these strange little invisible things. How, how did, what ever got you sort of started on viruses? What's your background? You know? Oh, well, I, um, I grew up here in Hawaii. Uh, went to McKinley High School. I got to put a plug into that. Okay, good. Um, then went off to college, um, and then I came back as a uh, to work in a, uh, with the State Department of Health oh. as an environmentalist. And then I decided to go to a graduate school um, where uh, I studied under Dr. Richard Thompson at the University of Cincinnati, studying herpes simplex virus oh. and how herpes simplex virus um, kills mice through encephalitis. Actually, that affects us too. Uh, there are about 5,000 cases per year of children uh, dying from a herpetic infection, uh, brain swells, virus uh, uh, um, uh, replicates uncontrollably. Um, so it is a health problem uh, with a herpes simplex virus. And then I studied how genes affect that process. Mm -hmm. Uh, from there, I was, went on to train as a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School studying okay. HIV. Super. Um, so I switched from herpes simplex virus to HIV just to get a broader sense mm -hmm. uh, of disease processes and how the virus um, actually put together itself. And then possibly uh, um, help in the design of uh, HIV vaccines. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. So I did most of my work on HIV, okay. and then I tried to... Uh, later on, uh, part of my career at the National Cancer Institute is to utilize vaccines as a way of curing disease. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of having viruses cause disease, have uh, vac uh, viruses help in curing some diseases. Super. And then I moved back here and joined with Oceanet. Mm -hmm. um, my background is part of a team of different type of scientists there at Oceanet. The, we, we are, uh, we, we, uh, value diversity, <laughs> just like mm -hmm. we should uh, in the general population. Our, my background is, uh, it, it fits in with Oceanet because we want to bring in experts in certain fields, but then think of a larger problem. Mm -hmm. So my, my uh, training in virology kind of helps uh, Oceanet to see the entire uh, problems that, that are in the world and try to help solve that. Excellent, excellent. Uh, that, that's super. It's, uh, it's very important to, to do that kind of stuff and, and to, to bring multiple perspectives to bear. Yeah. You know, you got a, a room full of people all thinking alike and you never get much creative done, right? Everyone that's right. The same answer again yeah, and again. That's right, because um, uh, when I'm thinking about viruses and if I have a problem, I can, um, a, a, a radio frequency guy can get, <laughs> come in and say, have you ever thought about this? He's like, oh, wow. Right, <laughs> right. the physicist in the room and the chemical yeah. engineer have, have very different viewpoints than you do. Absolutely. Exactly. Well, that's, that's and, and that's the power of younger children, because they ask these questions, how about this? <laughs> right? right? That's true. That's true. Yeah. As we go on in life, we tend to somewhat kind narrow our thinking. Way, and, yeah. And, and yeah, younger people often have a, a broader viewpoint in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, let, let's, let's start, though, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about viruses. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, people sort of think all viruses are bad. Yeah, yeah not, yes, uh, that's what the fir very first thing, right. um, and that's what we report on, diseases sure, sure. caused by viruses, yeah. such, such as the influenza, right. polio, and the current outbreak in the, on the Big Island, the right. dengue virus, and, and, Zika. Then the, <laughs> and Zika virus in the, uh, actually, uh, uh, all the tropical regions, not right. just in Brazil, but in uh, Africa as well. Right. Um, so let's, um, so, uh, where so, do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, the point is, viruses, though, aren't all necessarily harmful. They're, they're, so they're not. Neutral viruses, plus, it, it, if I understand it correctly, and again, viruses aren't my real area of study, but it, it's apparent that over evolutionary time scales, viruses have incorporated themselves into a lot of other life forms and, and are now sort of chronically parts of, of other right. organisms. Right, it is part of our genome, right. our, our chromosomes are made up of, uh, I, I, uh, I think the latest estimate is about a tenth of our genome is, is viruses, yeah. ten to one third or so. Um, and we can use uh, that information to track 
viral uh, human evolution. Right. So um, because these viruses are dormant within us, they don't. Um, some make particles, or I mean, uh, free living uh, right. viruses that move out of the cells, and some just stay there and just kind of hang out. Right. <laughs> uh, there, um, so that's part of the, the study of viruses is how viruses incorporate into our, our genome and helped us evolve into what we are today. Exactly. Right. So, and um, viruses, of course, do cause diseases. Um, and there are a number of outbreaks uh, throughout history um, that we are studying um, in order to understand how those viruses uh, infected people back then, how it affects us today. So we know that in Egypt, uh, there are polio incidences. It was depicted in uh, the hieroglyphs um, that, are, that show uh, malformation of limbs mm -hmm. caused by, uh, by polio virus. There's also incidents of smallpox virus in mm -hmm. infections in, in ancient China um, that were coming into light and trying to see what's going on uh, with the evolution of smallpox virus and people to, that deals with it. Yeah. Ho hopefully smallpox should not be a problem anymore. It shouldn't right? be a problem. I think we've <laughs> that's eradicated a, that. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing, next, amazing success story in its own right. That is. Um, polio is next on the target list. Down yeah. to three countries now? Three countries, yeah. 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 But there, um, the latest news on that is that we're making very good progress. Excellent. Excellent. So again, pe pe people, I think, don't understand what viruses are because they are a very funny entity. They're they, not they are. exact. They're not like a real like a real cell. Yeah. And so, but they're not they're not like just inanimate stuff either. Right. Like a spaceship and just <laughs> invading cells, attacking cells. Right. They they don't they they do that on on half of their lives. So. In, in terms of viruses now, most people think of viruses as these free-living entities. Right, these little particles. Little particles that can be passed in the air to right. and from people. And right. in, in fact, every breath we take, right. take in, we get about 100 or so particles, uh, virus particles that in, inhale us, uh, in, uh, that we inhale into mm -hmm. our systems. Our immune system actually does very good in, in containing the, the uh, virus infections, mm -hmm. uh, keep them in check. It's only when we get sick right. or, or if we are on drugs that suppress our immune right. system that we tend to see uh, virus infections that, are, that we normally don't see very tough, like chicken pox. Right. Um, that can be a huge problem if our immune system is, is, is uh, um, suppressed somehow. Yeah. And then the other half of the virus life is that, like I said, it's a free living particle. And then the second half is that it has to infect cells. Right. And that infected cell is part of their life. Right. Um, because they, since they're so small, we can hardly see them. Um, and um, that um, they, they can't carry enough information to do the work themselves. Right. This is why they, they're. Some people sort of think they're not living because in that yeah. free, in that free living form, that free form mm -hmm. as a particle, they are basically just some genetic information covered by a protein coat and maybe a lipid outer layer. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And there's nothing. There's no cellular nothing. machinery. They don't yeah. have. They don't have Golgi bodies and endoplasmic reticulum and all the right. things that mm -hmm. cells need to go. And they actually don't. They don't do, do anything. anything right? they, really. don't, they don't actually live in that sense, except right. they. they end up hooking up to a cell. And that's where the action occurs. Right. That that their genetic material in yeah, there. It requires a cell, a whole cell, right. in order for it to, um, and, and the goal of a virus is to make more of itself. And it's to the make, goal of all life forms, right? It's a goal of all life forms. So in that sense, right. Right. Um, that they're alive, right. because they're part of that cell. Um, they, they want to make lots of themselves, right. and and I mean a lot, right? From one particle, uh, HIV makes 10 to the 6. Wow. You know, that, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a million particles. So in a single cell. In a right? one single cell. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so and and they, they want to make the, so viruses make more of itself because not every one of them are functional mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. So they can, they're non-living, but then they don't know that they can't, uh, that they have, there are some g genetic defects. So in 10 to the 6, about 10% are not right. functional itself. Yeah. So this is a sort of classic example of uh, Richard Dawkins' selfish gene hypothesis. Selfish gene, right, right. It, it, make more the, of itself so that viral some... Gene, yeah, the viral will, gene will, is just purposely right. 
using its host cell to manufacture more of itself. Right. 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 And basically, they, they sort of they co-opt the cellular machinery. The cell is usually sitting there trying yeah. to make more that, of itself or to live right. and do its normal functions. Yeah, and then that range, uh, viruses can range in a full spectrum. It can be benign. You know, right. it just kind of hangs out there, like quietly, quietly, like uh, and integrate into the genome, like a retrovirus, mm -hmm. or it can make a lot of viruses yes. and then kill the cells by once right. once it formed all the little progeny viruses, right. it'll it'll lyse the cell and then escape, and so that it can infect more and more cells. Right. So that yeah. gets us actually because when you point out that you can get a million of these viruses mm -hmm. in a single cell, you know these viruses have to be very, very, very small. Yes. I think we've got a, yeah, we've got uh, a slide that will show something about the size of viruses. And right, yes. and I tried to give scale right. of, of viruses. Um, the, uh, a plant cell is the size of an exercise ball. Okay. And our, our cells, mm -hmm. and animal cells, it's about the size of a dodgeball where we can kind of grip it. Relevant to that, yeah. Kind of relevant. Right. Yeah, and, uh, uh, grain of baby powder. <laughs> little talc. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's about the size of a water balloon. Mm -hmm. And then a bacterium. Ones that infect our guts. Right. Um, ones that are in soil are about the size of a tennis ball. And then a large virus, you know, the ones that we uh, associate with, like herpes simplex virus, uh, Ebola virus, they're, they're golf ball size. Okay. And then the very tiny ones, like the ones that cause polio or even the, that infects bacteria. Are about the size of an aspirin. Right. So. And, and another analogy would be that, um, and I just kind of thought this up, as I was walking downtown, all these tall buildings, if that is a human body, mm -hmm. a virus that infects that human body is probably a speck of dust yeah. within, that, within right. that building. Right. Viruses, the dimensions of viruses are, are measured in nanometers. Right. Or in nanometers. Which is a billionth of a meter. Right. right. Which right. is, as I, I, I'm fond of quoting, it's the amount your fingernails grow in one second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is not much. <laughs> not very much. You won't see it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so they're generally tiny with, with some recently discovered exceptions. Right? There are some now giant viruses. There are. There are some that are called Mimi virus right. is one, one uh, particular family. It's uh, about the size of a, uh, a, um, a bacterium itself. Right. So, so the definition, the classical definition, back in the 1940s or so, when we were um, when we were filtering everything we can to make it sterile, mm -hmm. especially you know, right after World War II, where water was contaminated, uh, we filtered everything, um, and then although some people were getting sick, and some, so we tested that in mice that we injected into um, a, a contaminated uh, source of water, or not maybe not water, but uh, the contaminated source of liquid that um, they filtered out, injected into mice, and that mice got sick. Now the filter is very tiny. Right. And so it got rid of all the bacteria. Got rid of all the bacteria, but the, the mice got sick. Right. So that was the definition of virology. Yeah. Is yeah, that there were some smaller things. Much smaller. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, it's, it's the same idea as when we're looking at, uh, in the physic, uh, particle physics world, you know, atoms were thought to be the smallest one. Right. And then we find out there's more and more right. smaller and more smaller things. Right. Yeah, you, you break them apart. Right. And the uh, so that's, that's then a, a very uh, sort of a the life cycle of virus mm -hmm. is it goes through these two phases mm -hmm. and basically so once a virus has injected its genetic material into a cell, then the shell basically sits there and presumably is sort of discarded on the... Well, so some viruses actually gets incorporated into ah, the, the whole thing. The whole thing. Okay. Got kabit and kabuto. Okay. All the way in. And then some, like you do, uh, like you mentioned, is that it just injects its material, uh, genetic material, because that's the business end of, of the right. viruses, right. is the genetic material. But when, when, when viruses get engulfed into the... Uh, um, into the cell itself, it still has to break open. Okay. Um, but when, when it wants to do that, it, it, it has to migrate to a certain area so that efficiency also becomes the factor for that virus um, so that it can make more of itself, but mo much more efficient. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, this is, this is great. So we, we've got a good overview on viruses here. We're going to come back and talk in more depth about your work that you're doing and okay. why you do it, what you do, how you do it. <laughs> Um, okay. But that's going to be in a minute. Right now, we're going to take a short break here. Uh, we're on Likeable Science. Dexter Poon from Oceanit is with me here talking about viruses. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we'll be right back. Aloha. My name is Kaui Lucas. I am the host of Hawaii is My Mainland here every Friday 
on Think Tech Hawaii at 3 p.m. I invite people who are doing interesting and inspiring things in our community to help us keep it local and keep it real. Tune in any Friday, 3 p.m. and also available on our YouTube channel and my blog, kawilucas.com. Hawaii is my mainland. Aloha. Why? Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island and a physician. I host a show weekly called Healthcare in Hawaii, where we talk about the most important issues in healthcare for our state, whether it's the dengue fever outbreak, the state of our public hospitals, how to find physicians and nurses for our patients, or really just the best things to do for our family's health. That's what you'll find on this show. I'll bring experts to your attention, and we'll have a free-flowing dialogue. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> And you're back here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host of Likeable Science, Ethan Allen. With me today on Likeable Science is Dexter Poon from Oceanut. We're talking about viruses. And we've, we were just discussing how they're very tiny. And, but despite being so tiny, they come in multiple forms. And we, we have a slide that shows some of the different sort of shapes of viruses in, in, in a sort of schematic way here. Yeah, yeah so um, these are viral shapes. Uh, and, and you know, if, if I, I was an artist, right. uh, th these, this would certainly intrigue me <laughs> that uh, right. they can make these type of different structures. Right. But all what you're uh, seeing here are basically this outer protein coat, right? Yeah. yeah. So that can be arranged in a long tube, long like a tube. helix, mm -hmm. or a, a, a very geometric figure, like an polyhedron, uh, right? Yes, or or a, almost a perfect sphere, or something fairly fancy there. The one looks a bit like a little spaceship. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Um, and then we, um, so, so these virus shapes uh, infect every type of cells. Um, the, the complex one, the bacteriophage, infects a bacteria. Right. So these are really, really tiny. Right. To <laughs> infect a bacteria. Right. The, uh, uh, the I, uh, polyhedral one up there, adenovirus, I work with that okay. as well. Um, and that's being very popular now to use uh, as a vector. We'll as talk a vector. Later yeah. on the show about yeah. getting, getting on into that, how, how those are used. Yeah. yeah. So um, how do we know that these shapes? Are in um, right are like that right? right? So we have another slide that actually shows some. I think these are scanning EMs of uh, scanning you know, electron, electron micros micrographs, micrographs. Some and uh, so since they are so tiny, the uh, visible light in the hundreds of nanometers can't see them because right. they kind of fall in between the wavelengths. Right. So you have to use the wavelength of a electron right. in order to to see them. So, um, and these are actual pictures, and these are not my pictures, and I have to give credit to uh, various scientists uh, around the world mm -hmm. uh, for these pictures. Um, uh, top one is, I'm intimately familiar with, because it's, I've worked with that, is HIV-1. You can see the barrel mm -hmm. shapes. And then uh, right in the middle is the, in, the influenza, right. the ones that we get uh, yeah. shots of all e the time. Ever mutating. <laughs> Ever mutating, mm -hmm. and you can see the spikes on there. Yeah, so those spikes are the, the, the attachment uh, parts. And those are what keep changing all the time, They keep right? changing yeah. all the time. Makes, our, our cells... Makes it so hard to keep, to keep the flu at bay. Right, and then the most, the, the ones that I like the most is that Ebola one on the <laughs> right-hand like side. <laughs> well, I mean, it, because it looks like a worm. Right, like, yeah, it is. It's, what it's, the? <laughs> but it's basically a long helical virus, right? Yep, yeah. like a, that classic hook on the top. Yep. But a and, and very then, nasty, uh, mm -hmm. very high death rate from that. Very high death rate. Rather, rather unpleasant symptoms. Yeah, but not a large variety of them. Right. Um, Ebola is only you know, a few members, not like, uh, unlike uh, influenza. Right, <laughs> which has yeah, many, many types, right? Many, many different right. types. But so, okay, let's say I don't have my handy-dandy electron microscope sit, sitting around. Uh, how do I know if, if there's right. a virus there in some tissue or something? Right. Um, so we rely on biochemical or even genomic analysis to uh, identify them. So if, if we don't see them, that doesn't mean that they're not there. Right. It's just like a, on a surface of, of a, uh, a bathroom, for, for instance. We can take a swab right. of, of that bathroom surface before we put in, you know, touch our eyes and get infected that way, we can take a swab and then we can take that swab and look for the parts of the virus that, we're, that, um, that we can use to detect, um, mm -hmm. that, that reagents are available for. 
So influenza, uh, we have antibodies okay. derived from us or from, from an animal that attaches to the outer surface of the, uh, of the virus, specifically to that and not something else. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can put a tag at the end of that um, antibody, say a fluorescent tag, so mm -hmm. that if it binds to it and then we do a little bit of wash because it, uh, the antibody binds to the surface of the, of the virus very tightly, right. so we, uh, it won't come off in a wash. And then if we see fluorescence, right. a light, and we can be pretty much sure that this is um, influenza virus. Right. And if we were just to swab the surface of this table in front of oh, us, yeah. we, we would find viruses here. We would find uh, about 100 million or so <laughs> of viruses, especially doorknobs and uh -huh. bathrooms. There's other means of detecting it. So mm -hmm. I can swab like what I did um, told before using antibody. We can look for the genetics okay. because influenza, just like you and I are different in genetics, right. the um, influenza are different from us and from each other. Right, so all so viral, viral strains have their own genomes. Genomes, right. and then we can, uh, we, we use a technique, um, we can either, uh, uh, if there's enough there, we can just, um, blow it up, lice it, lice it uh, put it on a gel, um, and then we can visualize uh, certain diagnostic patterns through that mm -hmm. genome. If there's not enough, then we use a technique called PCR, polymerase mm -hmm. chain reaction, where we amplify millions of copies from that one or two or 10 or 100 uh, copies of that influenza virus genome, mm -hmm. and that million that we amplify, we can test. Right. Right. Gives you enough to, to sort it out and yeah. figure out what yeah. it is. Yeah. Cool. So th th those are other ways besides the electron microscope to really yeah. tell what virus you have if you have viruses there. Yes. So yeah. so what and is it? So what is a what does a typical day for you look like? Oh well, uh, we we uh, I, um, swabbing things. <laughs> well, <laughs> we we take water samples okay. and, and then we can test for bacteria. Excuse me. Uh, bacteria or human viruses present in that water sample um, to see uh, where, where the source of contamination, or is it human versus something else? Okay. Uh, that, that's uh, one of our um, uh, services at OceanNet. Okay. Um, we're also getting ready to look at an infection in tilapia, uh, aqua, hmm. in aquaculture. Um, they are, um, it's Franciella, and we can, uh, we, we, we see the disease uh, but we also want to make sure that it is the bacterium that is causing that disease. Uh -huh. Yeah, so th that's an up, up and coming uh, uh, a project. Uh, we're also looking at HIV vaccine, okay. um, and we'll talk about that uh, a little later on, okay. and, and, and the, how we can use viruses mm -hmm. as, as a means of uh, therapy. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we also are interested in developing different diagnostics for viruses or even bacteria. Right, it's useful to be able to detect them quickly, Very, cheaply, simply, but accurately. But accurately, right. yeah. So uh, one of the worst things that we as a scientist uh, don't want to have is what we call false positives right. or false negatives. Right. So, so we want to be able to say that I have confidence in our assay. And having a picture like an SEM, right. yes, that, that's great. It, there's, it's a yes or no. Right. But, um, but in a biological assay or a biochemical or a genomic assay, we have to be sure of our results. So we do a lot of, a lot of controls. Mm -hmm. A lot of, um, um, we add things that we know it's there. Uh, um, we, so we've isolated DNA um, in a typical assay. We have isolated DNA that I know for sure is, say, HIV. Um, we put it in one well so that our reaction is controlled. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't amplify, that means something went wrong with my, my components or, or the machine or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a um, false negative control. Mm -hmm. um, and then a false positive is that we add just water, mm -hmm. you know, something that is hanging around the lab mm -hmm. uh, because you never know, right? Sure. Yeah, there's lots of people around. There's mm -hmm. um, things that are that I'm working next to. Oh, yeah. To uh, it, it can uh, yeah. cross contaminate. Right. So um, want to be sure that my reagents are not positive. Right. So that's a control for a false positive. So 
So we, we were talking a little bit before the show about, about believing in data, which just seems like yeah. a, a, good, a good segue here. Uh, and, and we each sort of said we had, we had a story about, about, yeah. about yeah. data and, and believing in your data. So uh, what, yeah. what, what? One of the things that uh, I was working on in, um, at the National Cancer Institute at the AIDS vaccine program is that we're, we wanted to make a virus particle that is devoid of all the genome. So, but everything looks the same. Um, it's like a golf ball, but hollowed out, or an egg hollowed out, okay. just a shell there. And the reason for that is that because it's hollowed out, it looks like a real virus. Right. And, and our immune system should react to it. And that's our uh, definition of a vaccine candidate is that right. it looks like it. Right. But so it your body should react to it the same way it would to the real virus, right. and yet it's totally incapable of doing anything harmful right. to you. Right. right. And then, so we, I'm, I'm studying a uh, protein called nuclear capsid protein, and then downstream of that is a, is a protein called P6. And then there's a, to be technical here, there's a shift there. But I made a, uh, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's a different story. Uh, upstream of that, there is a, um, a uh, another gene called the capsid protein. And then there's a specific site that was easy for me to just um, cause a mutation that would delete all of that. Um, not, not the genome, but the, the proteins that make, make this up. Um, and when I did that, um, you know, I talked to our um, the, the other scientists around, and they said, oh, you shouldn't make any particles, right? And then I, did, I made my mutation, made virus, did the test to demonstrate, and it's a biochemical test. Capture, uh, it's called ELISA, where we uh, antibodies, and then we're, we're looking at the virus coming down. Mm -hmm. um, and lo and behold, there was particles. Uh -huh. Then I thought, oh, maybe I did something wrong. Sure. So you try it again. I tried it again. <laughs> and then still made particles. Huh. And then I asked someone else to do it, just so that right. I'm not biased. Right. And, then some, and then when they came back, and I didn't tell them anything, right? And they said, no, it's positive. This is how much particles you made. <laughs> I said, oh. Okay. <laughs> so I went to my boss and, says, uh, and, and said, it makes particles. He said, no, it doesn't make particles. <laughs> yes, here it is. Here's my data. He said, okay. <laughs> that looks good. And then he tried it and he said, yep, it makes particles. And then we pulled in another investigator, senior investigator, uh, to think outside the box and mm -hmm. say, this probably is a good vaccine candidate. Uh -huh. So lo and behold, I think well, we, um, we went forward with that. Uh -huh. Because it's, it's making something, something yes. that looks like a particle, yep. at least. When what, everyone said it shouldn't. <laughs> and and yet it doesn't have the genomic or the genetic capability yeah. of, of doing an infection. Yeah. Huh. That's, that's, that's amazing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But you, 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 I you, believed you, in my data. Yeah, absolutely. But I did everything I, uh, to show that the data is believable so right. that I can convince someone else. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, a uh, very, very much lower level, a very, very simpler <laughs> thing. So, uh, I spent six years of my life training fish to approach illuminated targets. I was looking at color vision in fish, and so I would give them wow. different colored targets, one lit up and one not lit up. Uh -huh. And I had done this across the vis visible spectrum from red, uh, from red light down to blue light, basically. I was getting on in my data collection for my thesis for my doctorate, and I realized in looking at my data, I needed more data out at the red end of the spectrum. Oh, okay. So I took one of my subjects who I'd been a very good subject. She was very reliable. She was very good, behaved well, but I had done all of her work had been in blue to green light. Okay. So one day I just switched her over and gave her red light and figured, you know, this, this will be fine. She's, she's a great subject. She, she knows this test. I made it real bright at first so it should be a real obvious distinction for her, you know. And, you know, sort of plugged everything in, started the, the test, walked away from it, came back and looked at my data, and this fish was getting 0% right. That is, light would come on over here, and she'd go over here. Light would mm. come on over here, and she'd go over Zero here. Zero percent. Very, very, selecting very carefully the wrong target. Wow. And I was like, this makes no sense. I Correct. checked all my connections to be sure I had things wired up properly, and the next day I watched her, and sure enough, you know, light would come on here, she'd go here, light would come on here, she'd go here. Mm. I was very puzzled by that, and she was getting quite frustrated because she wasn't getting any food either. <laughs> <laughs> she only got food for the correct response. Mm. Um, so the next day I put her back on blue light just to check, and sure enough, she was doing virtually 100% perfect. You know, light here, she go went here, light went over here, she'd go here, you know. Mm -hmm. Put her back on red light the next day, and sure enough, light would go on here, she'd go here, vice versa. Yeah. I was really puzzled by that. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, if I put yellow light on, 
Not, mm -hmm. not red, not blue, but yellow. Mm -hmm. She'll do something odd. I just mm -hmm. know she's going to do something weird. And I put yellow light on, and she would come into her tank, and she would just stop. Mm -hmm. And she just hung there, and she could not make a choice. Mm -hmm. Literally, my, my data, she timed the whole device out. It gave her 10 seconds to make the choice. And every trial, she just timed it out. She would just hang in the middle of the tank and couldn't choose. And I realized that at the end, my data was telling me that she had learned a color discrimination. She had learned to approach the bluer target. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when I gave a red light, the non-illuminated target looked bluer, basically, mm -hmm. than the red target. Yellow, it didn't really matter to her. Like, she couldn't make that choice, you know? Ah. So it was, again, it was looking at your data and believing in it. You know? Believing in your yeah. data. So right. They, they don't, don't lie to you, you know? Right, right. <laughs> you got, it takes you where, where you need to go. Exactly, exactly. Hey, on that note, I think maybe we'll go and take another break here. And uh, then we'll come back. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen, here with Dexter Poon from Oceanet, talking about viruses. And we'll be back after a short break. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from uh -huh. 4 to 5 p.m. Sure, it's about technology. Sure. It's about how people are collaborating and saying? solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there. 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today here in the Think Tech studios is Dexter Poon from Oceanet, a senior biomedical scientist who studies viruses, and that's what we've been talking about. Um, during the break, we saw we, we had a tweet here. You can always tweet us at, at thinktechhi, that's at thinktechhi. And Alicia Wood Charlson uh, writes us about what are what are viruses? How do they live? Um, and it's it gets actually back to our what we were talking about a little bit earlier. They have that sort of two phase cycle. Yeah. When, when they're a, a particle, a separate independent entity, they can basically exist for some fairly long period of time, right? I mean, they're not really metabolizing anything. Right. It depends on the virus itself. Okay. Uh, because it's all about the outer coat. Sure. And that outer coat, if it's complex, like a like a polio virus, and if it's small like a polio virus, it can exist for a long, long time in that free particle state. When you say a long, long time, you're talking weeks, months, years? Weeks. Oh, okay. uh, um, they can live in the refrigerator, <laughs> or I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, freezer, the ultra low freezer, for indefinitely almost. Um, there are samples like smallpox that are being frozen. Um, that you can just thaw out and infect a cell. But, so the, the free particle part can exist in the right conditions for millennium. Okay. Um, there, uh, in that free state, um, there are some, uh, depending on the virus, like I said, that it, it does not, it is not suitable for it because the lipid bilayer, bilayer is, is mostly coming from our cells. Mm -hmm. It's lipids. Mm -hmm. Lipids uh, can dry out, <laughs> right? right? Uh, the protein, outer coat protein, where that, uh, it, um, the virus attaches to the cells can fall apart mm -hmm. um, because we, it, everywhere has lysozymes, uh, enzymes that can digest these proteins, mm -hmm. and then that could fall apart. Mm -hmm. If it can't attach to the cell and, and does its business, then it's not going to survive. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, uh, influenza virus, uh, HIV virus can last minutes to an hour or so mm -hmm. um, out in a surface, okay. any surface. The second half of its life is within the cell, mm -hmm. and that's where all the actions occur. Right. Um, and, and they are alive in that sense right. because they're utilizing the cell's metabolism, the cell's replication cycle in order to make more of itself. Mm -hmm. The cell doesn't know that it is infected. Well, it does. Uh, some, some parts of it, of it, right. it does. Uh, but the viruses um, take over. Right. Um, the entire machinery of, of, the, of the cells 
to make more of itself. Mm -hmm. And it's part of that cell's cycle, right. um, metabolically, genomic, uh, genetically. Right, so then that duration is going to depend somewhat more on the cell and what kind of cell it is. And, and the virus and, itself, and, and, too, yeah. right? Um, right so that, that's called a replication cycle. Right. And uh, the vir virology classes in um, undergraduate and as well as graduate work will give you all those different scenarios, and there are, and that could last an uh, entire semester on just the replication <laughs> cycle of different viruses. Mm -hmm. right. Well, excellent. So. Viruses are now actually being sort of, we've, we've, viruses have co-opted our cellular machinery and the mm -hmm. cellular machinery of all kinds of other organisms, but now we're actually sort of co-opting viruses, right, for some of our oh, work. Oh, yeah. And, and you're, you're actually working on some of this stuff, right? Yes, uh, viruses is an important tool in our chess, uh, war chess of uh, attacking different type of diseases, mm -hmm. and I think we have a... I'm sorry? A slide? I think oh, we have no, a slide oh, for it. Right. Okay. So, um, uh, using viruses, some, some of our strategies in using viruses to, as a medicine um, is that, you know, antibiotic resistance, how do we kill vir uh, bacteria? Well, we can use the bacteriophage to kill that bacteria because bacteriophage will, once it's replicated, uh, make many, many copies of itself, it'll kill that bacteria and it has to be released. Um, the second, it's the same idea with the second part, killing tumor cells with a lysogenic virus. Um, because virus make a whole bunch of itself and it has to get out mm -hmm. and it'll kill the cell uh, um, during that process. Mm -hmm. We can also harness, so viruses also um, can incorporate itself into our genomes. Mm -hmm. So we can use that uh, power uh, in gene therapy. So say you have a defective gene such as adenosine deaminase, uh, the bubble boy syndrome you call it. Um, we can correct that defective gene. Uh, maybe hemophilia, we can also de try to... Uh, By sort of sticking it into a virus or onto a virus. Making it a function, uh, giving it, uh, donating that to that cell a functional copy of the gene itself. Right, right. I mean, the, vi the virus right. goes in, yeah. incorporates itself, and then it has rather inadvertently stuck in the working gene. That you right, need. Yeah. right, right. So that's called gene therapy, right. and that's a large, large field uh, mm -hmm. ongoing right now. Right. And then we have a, um, in, in Oceanet, we have an HIV vaccine um, candidate project in which we're um, not using viruses, but synthetic viruses. And that's the next step, I think, uh -huh. in, in, in terms of, of a new, new area. So uh, viruses have taught us a lot. Mm -hmm. So why not make it synthetic? <laughs> so that is uh, so that making your own viruses. Making now. our own virus, so right. You shape a protein coat. Right. And, and there's there's a number of reasons for doing that right. uh, because viruses are target specific, so they bind to a certain cell. Um, adenovirus will bind to the CAR receptor, um, uh, cellular adenovirus receptor. Okay. Uh, HIV binds to CD4 first, and then C, uh, and then the CC uh, cytokine receptors uh, next. So, in synthetic virus, well, we can put that on you know those those type of receptors on the virus so that it can make it modular like a Legos mm -hmm. <laughs> type okay. of deal, and then these um, um, synthetic viruses can also we can also package things into it. Right. So instead of the viral genome, we can put say a, a, a functional gene mm -hmm. or a gene that can recruit um, uh, cytokines, mm -hmm. uh, recruit a certain type of T cells called mm -hmm. T's. Um, cytotoxic T cells. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also generate antibodies re response to that. So uh, put on uh, something that it doesn't uh, like a viral, <laughs> like a viral protein, like um, like a herpes uh, glycoprotein on mm -hmm. the surface, so that when our immune system system sees that tumor, um, it'll recognize it as being infected uh -huh. uh, with say herpes, mm -hmm. and it's, it, it'll clear it for, oh. for you. Um, and that's one of the problems that we have in, in cancer therapy is the resistance and then uh, lack of immune uh, response to that um, tumor. So now we're, 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 we're creating an infection right. synthetically. <laughs> oh, okay. But uh, you mentioned uh, the intriguing thing with now using viruses to, to fight uh, tumors when viruses are actually also in some cases promote tumors, right? And, and yeah. cause them actually. Right, but then we're going to um, it, it's, it's ironic, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, we can harness, uh, we, we've studied how viruses cause cancer. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to use it against that. 
against that tumor yeah, that it resides a, there's in. There's a beauty to that. There's, there's a beauty <laughs> to it, right? Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And so wh where do you see this going? I mean, are viruses going to be sort of the tool of the future, uh, or at least a strong tool, it sounds like? I would certainly promote that mm -hmm. <laughs> because I, as a virologist, I want to share with everyone that viruses are, are, are harmful, yet we can use the knowledge that we gain from studying these viruses um, in our arsenal against uh, other diseases. Mm -hmm. um, the future of, of virus as a medicine um, is certainly on the rise. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots and lots of research programs going on um, in, in, on, on the mainland worldwide. Uh, mm -hmm. There are certain institutes and, and we're moving certain, some, some of these uh, things into the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So we'll see in the future, and I certainly do hope that viruses are better understood, more work be done, and then um, much more work to how to harness that into a, um, into a product that uh, will, will help human health. Right, but it's a very tricky business, right? Because again, this gets back to this fundamental question of what a virus, when you get particularly these sort of quiescent viruses that, that go into a cell, embed themselves in cellular uh, genetic machinery mm -hmm. and then sort of sit quietly for years in some cases, like, like some of the herpes viruses, right? So how do you, you know, how do you get those, how do you find them? Because right. they're, they're now they're just part of a seemingly normal looking cell, right? Yes, um, but since they're hanging around indefinitely, let's put them to work, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, so a herpes virus, um, it, it, it uh, infects neuronal cells specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, it resides as a circle. And that circle, um, herpes is, uh, we can take out some what we call non-essential genes. We can take those out and then put in essential, uh, not, sorry, sorry uh, donate extraneous genes or genes that um, say, uh, once we find out what, um, how, how Alzheimer's develop, we can put in that medicine type of gene oh. to combat uh, at, um, Alzheimer's disease. Oh. Um, and then get some of the chronic herpes infection that yeah. sort of fe so, feeds, their, feeds them properly, basically. Yeah, so, so we could, you, you can, um, um, it, it's a dual edge, I guess, uh, sword. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to get a herpes infection, mm -hmm. but you're not. You know, if we, if we can solve the Alzheimer's disease and use herpes as a vehicle for solving that, um, it, it's two things. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, is, that is, it's, it's just amazing to, he to hear all this, this wonderful mix of, of sort of the, the clever way that viruses can be so, so harmful to us yeah. and, and the amazing stuff that's now happening because of people like you who are, are turning this around and figuring out how to turn the viral tools and put them to our use. And that's why it's very important for us to um, fund uh, basic science uh, in, into viruses as well as uh, other areas um, into so that we can learn uh, from from how, how these viruses behave in nature um, so that we can turn it <laughs> against itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audiences out here have learned many, many things. Uh, I so much appreciate your coming by and, and sharing your, your wealth of knowledge here in such, such a good, accessible way. Thank Great. you very much, Dexter. This, this is fun. Yes, Thanks. indeed. Dexter Poon of Oceanit. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, uh, Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. See you next week.